Hey everybody, Scott Wegener here with the Garrison at Nobleman Square, where filmmakers talk about their craft. You know, Halloween is just around the corner, and what better time to talk with creature actor Doug Jones. He stars in Star Trek Discovery, and he was also the creature in The Shape of Water. I caught up with him in Toronto, where he took a break from shooting Star Trek to talk to me via Zoom. He hails from Indianapolis, Indiana, and he talked with me about his Midwest values and how those helped him with his career. Give a listen. Because you're so so well known for so many things, a lot of people in the Med Midwest may not realize that, yeah, you're one of us. Well, yes and no. Um, uh, I've been an actor for 35 years now, and, and over that time, um, I've been interviewed quite a bit by, by my, the local press in Indianapolis, of course, because that's where I come from. That was my high school. And I went to college at Ball State University. Uh, so it just, yeah, it depends. It depends. But then there's always a new generation coming up. And, and then the, I, I, on the social media, you, you get a, a gauge of who, who knows what about you. And every time I post something, I'll get like a flood of like, I didn't know you were in that. Oh, my God. And then a lot of times, and he's a Hoosier. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that happens. That happens a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Which is really sweet. I love, I love being, I'm very tethered to, to the Midwest and to home um, anyway, because uh, those, I feel like those are where my people come from. I, I hope I kept my sensibilities about me from the Midwest all this time. Can you talk a little bit about uh, growing up in the Midwest and how that kind of helped form the, the start of your career? Yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, once I moved out to California, I realized that there are different there are different USAs to experience. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I think um, uh, Calif uh, California and the Hollywood uh, vibe is very, very self-motivated, self, -motivated, self uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't want I don't want to say selfish in a derogatory way, but I want to I want to say but very self self aware. Uh, people are out there to pursue their hopes and their dreams, and and uh, so so some people can can take that into into the elbow realm where they're elbowing other people out, and not pleasant to be around. Um, the Midwest seems to be more family oriented, and um, uh, I think the value of of uh, you'll see churches on every corner. Uh, you'll see. Um, uh, you know, maybe I'm fantasizing about what it was like when I grew up, <laughs> but I, I, uh, but you you'll you'll find a work ethic that is uh, even if you're not happy every day at your job, um, you're good at what you do, and you do that because it provides for a family, or it, you know, it, it 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 enables the lifestyle that you want to have. Um, whereas, you know, I, I feel. I feel uh, that's a, that's a Midwestern value that I don't I don't want to poo poo any other place in the country, but that is that is um, a Midwestern value that I love and I have done that has that has served me well too, uh, because even even as an actor li living the Hollywood dream, I wouldn't say that that every gig has been like oh I'm it's so glamorous and I'm I'm loving every minute of this, because uh, well, like I just told you I worked until five thirty in the morning, um, I'm working on Star Trek Discovery now here in Toronto. And um, my feet hurt, my eyes are sore. I was wearing contact lenses and, and, and hoof boots all night and uh, had rubber glue glued down to my entire head and down to my collarbones and my skin is a little bit raw in my throat. I mean, just, you know, and I'm 61 years old. So, uh, so I, there's, there's times you tilt your head and you think, how? Okay, I, you know, but it's all about the finished product. It's all about, you can, you know, you can take pride in your work when you're done with it and look back and go, wow, we created something. Um, you know, instead of I'm not happy today, I'm, I'm out of here or, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, that's an attitude that, that I think the Midwest was, was very good in, in instilling in me. So what, how did, how did you, when you were working at Kings Island, were you anticipating and planning at that time to go to LA? Uh, what was, what was the jump from working <laughs> at the mime in Kings Island? To going yeah. out and and playing with the big dogs in LA, right? Well, uh, I was 22, just out of college at, at Kings Island, and um, that was about you know 
That was about uh, 17 years after I decided I wanted to be an actor, I, which I, I grew up watching TV and movies going, oh, I want to be on that screen. Uh, I love the fantastical escape of it all. I, I loved uh, the idea of becoming people that you aren't. And, um, you know, and that, of course, comes back to a childhood insecurities and wanting to uh, uh, medicate them. So escape is great. <laughs> you know, if you if you're not uh, if you you feel if you have insecurities and you feel that you're the ugliest person in the world and, and you know, you've been told that you have a long skinny neck and that's goofy and funny and, and gross or whatever, kids can be cruel to each other. So I fantasized about a world where, where uh, you know, where I could uh, sing, dance and entertain people. Um, and and mo a lot of actors will give you the same story they, that they, you know, an audience appreciation and going, oh, they love me, they love me is therapeutic for people who <laughs> are self-deprecating like me. Uh, so, um, so I think I got a beard from your question. I'm sorry. You, you, you know, just asking, how did, uh, you make the jump from, you know, working in KI to right. moving? Right. To, I mean, that's a huge leap to go to LA. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so I guess I was setting up that the dream was always there. Right. So, uh, and, and in, uh, the one thing I learned about the Midwest is that show business didn't really live there. <laughs> so I, if you want to keep, if you want to go up the ladder. So I knew I had to pick either New York or LA uh, where, where um, TV and film lived. And LA seemed to be more uh, uh, upon visits, you know, uh, with the family vacations or whatever. As it gets like, oh, I, I could live here, you know. Uh, and that the film industry was more prevalent there. Uh, there might've been more, more daytime television and commercials in New York or, but LA seemed, seemed the more um, logical place to go. So uh, the leap uh, happened after Kings Island. Uh, I moved, I was looking for, I, my Midwestern values were telling me, um, get a stable job. Uh, the showbiz is not what you, you know, you can't rely on that. Um, you know, I had my college degree to fall back on as they, as they say. Uh, so I started looking for, for, for daytime, you know, work a day, 40 hour a week jobs that could sustain me while I pursued arts on the side. So I, um, I got a job at, uh, I, I was interviewing a lot for sales positions and anything that my theater degree would let me do. <laughs> you know? So um, it was uh, a newspaper in, in North Manchester, Indiana that took me in as their advertising salesman so I was able to use some creativity, uh, creating newspaper ads for a small town business owner here and there, right? Um, and and uh, it didn't pay much, but during that time, I, I was living on my own and, and um, got married in the meantime to my college sweetheart who was finishing up her degree at Ball State University. We'd known each other for a couple of years already. And um, so once we got married, we lived in North Manchester for another maybe 11 months. And then we were talking on the phone with her uncle one day who lived in California. And he was a bank management, he was a bank manager, a branch manager of a, a large bank out there. How are you kids doing? Turned into me going, I don't know how much longer I can do this advertising job. It's just, I'm kind of, you know, how far can you go up in a small town newspaper? And I think I've reached the salary cap and it's really not much. So I don't know what my future holds. And he said, well, hey, what about, um, we have a management training program here at the bank. If, if you send me a resume, I can give it to the, uh, you know, human resources department and, you know, uh, we'll see, we'll see. And I'm like, I, I worked as a bank teller during summers, during college. Uh, to, uh, so I know banks, sure. Hey, and that would get us to California. That was the thing, a day job that would get us to the right place where I could then roll out into the showbiz one day. Well, they loved me because I interviewed well, but gosh, I was not a banker. So uh, found that out the hard way because we, we moved out to California. I took the job. I worked I, and it was in branch on the job training and then some seminars at the home, at the home, big, tall building downtown for uh, I did that for it was a nine month training program. And after eight months of that, they fired me and they should have. I was not a banker. I was I was an actor because I was faking my way through every day there, wearing a tie, holding a briefcase and acting like, I, yeah, I know how to how to account for cash in the vault and, and, and move pieces of paper around for people. I didn't. I didn't care. I didn't know. I was dying a slow death uh, when, you know, when, when a creative person it was a square peg round hole. 
there are people built for that and God bless them. We need them. I was not one of them. So uh, to when they fired me, it was kind of like I cried for about mm, an hour. And then I was like, oh, I think they just did me the hugest favor. <laughs> so I, um, so I, I uh, went on unemployment checks and talked to Mrs. Laurie and said, you know, we, the reason we moved out here was to go into the show business. So why don't we give that a go now, now that we're young and not much responsibility. And so I started taking a TV commercial acting workshop. And, uh, and that is what, uh, what really kind of was my springboard. I found a class that was taught by um, a man named Philip Carr, K-A-R-R. -R. And Philip was the, um, that was the, the vice president of the Wilhelmina Agency in Los Angeles. And as, as talent agents go, it was, they were in like the top 10 in the TV commercial department. And they're a big modeling name in New York. So they, they, have, they have name recognition. I didn't know who he was. So I was auditing classes and I ended up going back to his class. Like, yeah, I like the way he teaches. My second class, he approached me and said, do you have an agent yet? I said, uh, no, what is an agent? I was really that green. Awesome. So he gave me his card, he said, call me at the office. And uh, so I did, they became my first agency. So I got, I got an agent before I had headshots taken before I, and after a, a second acting class. So I was really fresh and, and nose picking idiot that didn't know how, how Hollywood worked. So uh, they had to groom me very quickly for going out on auditions. And, and I started going out on auditions about once a week, maybe I was not a union member and it was tougher to get me in the door, but six months of, of this turned into mm, my first commercial for Southwest Airlines as the dancing mummy and wrapped in head, from head to toe in dirty bandages. And I had no idea that, uh, that my mime background, both at Ball State and at Kings Island, <laughs> um, and my mascot background at Ball State as Charlie Cardinal, would and my contorting ability i can put my legs behind my head and on your resume that looks like a contortionist so my resume was stacked with a lot of physical tomfoolery i had no idea that that was going to be my calling card and would be oh, the how i got in the door for that mummy dancing mummy audition that i booked and then that would be the springboard uh, of things to come and and the uh, kind of boating of what was to come for my the rest of my career the prosthetics, what, how did it, it, it sounds like your first gig was wearing something where people couldn't see you. Something, right. And is that where, the, it seems like you have an affinity or at least Hollywood has an affinity for you in prosthetics. <laughs> how did that all happen? Yeah, it, it wasn't me because, uh, uh, you know, that going back to that kid in Indiana watching TV and watching Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore and, uh, I love Lucy on TV and, uh, um, you know, oh gosh, McHale's Navy and Hogan's Heroes and Gilligan's Island. And, and so sitcoms really, I didn't really watch children's programming. I watched uh, like uh, sitcoms made for adults. And I, I, I was getting my sense of timing and, I, and, a, and a, a grown up sense of humor earlier than I should have. And um uh, and then it was also variety shows. Everybody had a variety show back then, whether it was Carol, oh, Carol Burnett was the best. I would never missed an episode of Carol Burnett, but Donnie and Marie, Cher, Sonny and Cher, everybody had a, had a, you know, song and dance comedy sketch kind of uh, variety show. That's, that's where I wanted to live. I, I lapped that up like a kitten with milk. Uh, so that's what I was after. So the, now that I'm sitting here today, 35 years later, uh, uh, having just pulled rubber off my face a few hours ago <laughs> in my latest <laughs> alien other otherworldly creature gig. No, I did not see this coming early on. I did not pursue it. I didn't know really know it was an, uh, I didn't know really know it was a career option uh, until um, once, once you go in for an, uh, get a book, the commercial auditions I was getting from, from uh, agent Philip were, um, where a lot of a lot of like you know we need someone who's good at physical comedy we need someone who can you know a, with a mime background or a clowning background or a dance background and so I went in on all those auditions and a lot of those came with a specific look and some makeup that made you look like that so I didn't realize uh, that I was getting uh, circulating amongst the the creature effects makeup crowd out there in Los Angeles and there is one that's a tight knit sort of family that's very that they all know each other. So once you get in that loop, 
uh, you'll stay in it if you're if if you I have I have the right build. I'm being very tall and skinny. They can I've been told by many creature effects people that they can build things on me and I don't get too built bulky. And being as tall as I am, that can be an imposing creature or it can be a fun looking alien. You know, there's a lot that they can do with a tall, skinny frame. Uh, so, and, and this long neck that kids made fun of me for in, in grade school, high school, out in Los Angeles with a creature effects makeup artist, for the first time in my life, I heard, oh my gosh, has anybody ever told you how beautiful your neck is? And I, ha I had never even considered that was a possibility, right? <laughs> so... So it was really a, a lovely kind of homecoming to find my people in a way uh, and to find a place to put uh, the, the mime experience and the mascotting experience really kind of woke my body up to when you're an actor, you, everybody's working from head to toe. All parts of, your, of you are working to create a character. Even if it's a human in, in t-shirt and jeans, um, you assume a posture, gestures, a tilt of the head, facial expressions, everything that makes that person who he is. Um, or creature what it is so uh so that that kind of training really really i didn't realize that i was how set up and and and, and prepared i was for the career that, that that found me i did not look for it so so the creature effects make it people i kept getting once i once i got my my fourth tv commercial booking i was the south first was the southwest airlines commercial then then came a, a, a Pamela doll. It was a, a, a toy commercial, and I was an alien in that. Met some creature effects people um, in that. And then the next one was a, a, a human, a, a nerd with like horn room glasses and plaid pants for Bob's Big Boy commercial restaurant chain. And my fourth commercial booking, this is still within my first few months of being an actor. Uh, once that's... Uh, Actually, the timeline. Okay, so, yeah. Six months into my auditioning, I got the Southwest Airlines gig, and then they started coming faster. So the fourth one was by December, uh, uh, just about yeah, four or five months later. I booked a Max Night campaign for McDonald's, which was that crescent moon head that sang yeah, yeah. when the clock strikes. Hey, well, uh, they were looking for someone to wear that moon head and make it make the, the song come to life visually, and I booked that. And that turned into a three-year gig, uh, accounting for 27 commercials uh, for, uh, for McDonald's. So that was a, a great early gig to get for a, for a, a young, poor actor. Um, so, but again, I was covered with a moon head. Nobody knew who I was. And I was required to do lots of physical tomfoolery. And, and uh, that reputation then got around, it was really got around the creature effects shops. Uh, Steve Neal, who was the was the, the creator of the Moonhead and the head puppeteer for it, uh, would bring in people from other creature effects shops, um, whether it was, um, you know, Stan Winston Studios or Rick Baker Studios or, or Greg Cannon, like the big names in Hollywood that had won Oscars for their monsters and creatures. The people working there in their shops that he would borrow for our commercial shoots when we did them, occasionally. So. So they would go back to that shop afterwards and they would see a design being pitched to them from a, a TV show or, or a movie production that might be tall and skinny with a long neck and be like, oh my gosh, I just worked with somebody who that, that would be perfect on. And then you, I, it also came in well, those Midwestern values. I said yes to a job, so I didn't complain about all while I was there. I, I, you know, I, I stayed good humored and and, and uh, they, they tended to liked what I did on camera. So that helped the reputation get talked about later. And so my name got passed around. I got into all the Rolodexes and all of the uh, creature shops around LA. So, uh, so that word of mouth, um, most actors have to tap dance or, or, you know, or you know, do, do tricks for, for casting directors and get to know them through the auditioning process. I kind of slipped through the back door with this special niche where the production is already done their auditions for their you know, human actors, but they have this creature they don't know what to do with. So they ask the creature shop for their advice and the creature shop will say, oh, well, we've got a guy that can do that for you. And the producers kind of go, okay, great. If you, you, know, you know better than we do. So I, I skipped the audition process a lot, right? So, so that, that's kind of how, how that built. And it was a, and now I still simultaneously, meanwhile, was still um, doing the, the other conventional route auditioning and getting booked as humans in in all kind I, i've done over 100 commercials since uh, to date and a, about i would say more than half of them have been humans 
um, and, uh, and I've guest starred on TV shows as humans, I've, and I've done f feature films as humans. So I've done that, that's been a a, a two pronged career all these years. Right. Now, obviously, with with prosthetics, that tends to lend itself well to the horror genre. Um, and but the the kind of fare that you're well known for isn't your standard grindhouse movie. Thank um, you for noticing. <laughs> yeah. They, they've got a real heart. What, what do you look for in a script that, that gives you the kind of roles that you get? Right. Well, as you can, you, you pegs it right on the head. I had, I really wasn't aware. And I've never, I have, I have been a, a fan of horror when it is classic. And when there's a, when there's an emotional storyline and some redemptive quality to it, that's what I was a fan of as a kid and growing up. Uh, blood splattering on the wall didn't really always do it for me. And I know there's an audience for that and God bless them, you know, and there's, there's entertainment for everybody. I was more of a, of a, you know, creature from the black lagoon, the mummy, Frankenstein, uh, uh, Godzilla, <laughs> um, uh, oh gosh, King Kong. Those were, those were, there were anything in black and white was my, was my jo uh, gig as a kid. My jam, I guess they would say. Uh, so, uh, so, and what was so, those stories were not just like fantastical with a creature in them. They, they had such great, such great storytelling and such great um, statements to make. And, and uh, you know, and there was, there was, I loved how there was often a, a love possibility that just could never be. And it was always tragic. Like, you know, the creature and, and, and maybe, and then a human might, might connect in a way that was either understanding or friendship that, that, or sometimes it was romanticized, but gosh, it could just never be. So those stories always tugged at my heart. Um, so now, uh, uh, as you said, being known for wearing rubber bits and becoming creatures and monsters, that does lend itself very well to the horror genre. So most of the, a, a lot of the offers that I'll get just sent to me now, especially now that I'm more, a bit more established, is, uh, hey, here's our script. Uh, for this and and it will be oh my gosh if I get sent this script one more time the same script with different titles um, oh hey we're a bunch of half naked teenagers running around the forest on a camping trip uh, smoking pot and having sex and oh no here comes Doug Jones to kill all of us one at a time that's the script I don't want to I don't want to do <laughs> right because it's been told again and again and again and again and um uh, so and it, and, it, and they often just leave it at the end where he's still out there and there's a sequel to come. You know that <laughs> that's the kind of the formula. So it doesn't really sing to me. But long about 1997 is when I did. Uh, I got one of those random phone calls from a creature effects shop, and it was, uh, "Hey, there's a movie shooting. We're doing some reshoots for a big feature film." Uh, here in town in Los Angeles tonight. Can you can you make it down downtown um, by 11 p.m. for a night shoot? And I was like, oh, out of work actor. Let me check my schedule. Of course I can come. Right. So <laughs> that was great to get the phone call. Uh, so I went down there and it was for the movie Mimic. And that was a the, in Mimic. They were the tall bug, uh, like co overgrown cockroaches that took over the, the subways of New York City. And these, these cockroach sort of character, uh, creature, insects sort of mimicked what humans look like. So you couldn't really tell from a distance. They looked like they were a guy in a trench coat, almost when their wings folded over funny. So that, hence the name of the movie. So, uh, so I, I was, uh, they were, they'd already shot the movie uh, and, and they were doing some pickup, pickup shots for it. So uh, I had to stand on the edge of a four story brick building um, and look over the edge of it while there was rain coming down. A rain machine was sp spitting on me, and I was being, uh, you know, megaphoned from people down down on the ground. I couldn't see who anybody was, and so I, I, um, that was my first. That was my first thing I did. And then, then and then they had me. Oh, they liked what I did. Uh, I just had to lean over the edge of the building and look. That was it. Uh, and the next day was um, they continued for for two. I had me for two more days. Uh, and the second day was a green screen indoor shot. And so I had more, I could actually meet the director that day. And he sat down with me at lunchtime and it was Guillermo del Toro. 
Um, he, here was this, but I didn't know who he was. Uh, many Americans didn't because this was his first American studio film. He had done a lot in Mexico, a ton of work in Mexico before this in the Spanish language, uh, a lot of television. And, and he, he put his chin in his hands and he said, tell me everything you've been in before. So I started talking about what, what I'd done so far in my career. You know, by then I could tell him about, now this was 97, so I could, I, uh, I could tell him about working on Batman Returns and I could tell him being a clown there and uh, working with V. Neal, the makeup artist and um, uh, Hocus Pocus had shot by then. He, and he said, oh, is it Tony Gardner? Is he, is he a nice guy in real life? He knew everybody that I'd been talking about and he knew every monster that I had played. Uh, and he was truly a fanboy, you know? So, and, and uh, he was just such a kid and I, I, in, at heart and I loved that about him. He was unlike any director I'd ever talked with in my life before. And um, he told me that he used to make his own monsters when he would make his low budget things, um, you know, cause he was kind of a one man show. He directed it, wrote it and created all the, all the visual, uh, uh, you know, fantasy characters for anything, short films um, and TV projects. And, and he had done one feature film called Kronos in Mexico by then. Uh, so, so we connected and, we're, and we got a rapport going immediately. And then by the end of lunchtime, he said, do you have a card on you? And I did. And I gave him this goofy card with a, a cartoon drawing of me on it that I had done myself. Not a good choice. But anyway, he, he kind of chuckled and put it in his wallet. And he, um, uh, and then I uh, went on to do other stuff uh, after after that. The movie came out, and, but I, I went. Uh, a few years went by. About five years goes by, and I racked up more more uh, goofy credits like Monkey Bone and the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie, and uh, my my appearance on Buffy the Vampire Slayer as the lead gentleman um, in the Hush episode. Uh, and then um, uh, the time machine I'd done, uh, not, not, not yet, I hadn't done the time. Yeah, I had done the time machine. And um, then 2002 rolls around and I get another phone call, random from another creature effects person that I'd worked with before. And uh, it was Steve Wang at the Spectral Motion shop that had just opened. And he said, hey, we're, I've been, we're out to dinner right now with a director who says he's worked with you. Um, what, uh, 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 and, and we're doing a movie that with a character that we think you would be good for. Um, it was Guillermo del Toro they were out to dinner with. And uh, they were working on the movie Hellboy 1. And that day they had, they had unveiled the um, maquette for uh, the Abe Sapien character. And when Guillermo saw it for the first time, this, this little sculpture of, of what Abe Sapien would look like, Legend has it, he fell to his knees and he said, oh, you are so beautiful and I am so fat. I, I don't know what, what, I think he was looking at a beautiful thin character and, and, and had to self-deprecate. But, but when that happened, uh, the guys at the shop said, hey, we know who exactly who can, that what I just told you about before. We know, uh, we, uh, we know who, who should play this part and that would be Doug Jones. Guillermo said, Doug Jones, wait, I know Doug Jones. He pulled my card out of his wallet that he'd been carrying around for the last five years. And therefore, I got a phone call and, uh, and I became Abe Sapien in the first Hellboy movie. And that was the film that really cemented our relationship. We understood he, we had, could work together more intimately than uh, with um, all those things that actors and directors connect on. And, and we got a shorthand developed for uh, his directing style with me. And, and I, you know, he became my favorite director immediately and has been ever since. Um, and now, so the reason I, I went into that long story about him uh, is that that, that sprung up a, a 20 year relationship that, that's uh, where um, he would, it got to the point where he was writing characters for me. And uh, you know, when you, and, and he dips into the dark always. Uh, he, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily say that he makes horror films, but he makes, uh, he makes fantasy films, he makes, uh, uh, superhero comic book films, but he always has a dark element to them. He always has a horror element in there. Um, and, and, and he has said there, <laughs> he's been quoted as saying, there's a, there will always be a monster on my call sheets, no matter what I'm making. So it's like, okay. Um, so, uh, and, and that, that fit the bill for 
he also had a love and a reverence for the uh, the universal monsters and the the, the classic horror where uh, where there was a story but he he was also upset by the love that could never be and he, he, as he tells it the creature from the black lagoon um when he first saw that movie when he was a kid uh he said oh my gosh just seeing um oh, i'm gonna forget her name to play the lead role it's uh in, in the creature from the black lagoon she yeah but it's look upable yeah um she just passed away recently. I did meet her finally in real life, but when she was swimming on the surface and you saw the creature coming up under her and that underwater shot and how he thought that was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. And he thought he had a crush on both of them. <laughs> this monster and this beautiful woman in a little bathing suit. Uh, he was just like, and he really just thought that this was the beginning of a great love story. And he was just shocked and, and appalled that it turned into a home invasion story instead, where the creature was just living his best life. And these people came and ruined everything for him. So he kind of wanted to, um, you know, so he, he had a passion for monsters and he wanted to, he wanted them to find love and to, uh, to be complete and whole uh, and respected. So, uh, that, so he's lived a life and, a, and had made a career out of, out of monster, a, a true reverence for monsters. And he said that they've saved his life in, in, you know, when he's giving his acceptance speeches and all that. And then coming all the way forward through through movies like, uh, well, we did um, Hellboy 2 as well, The Golden Army, where I played three characters, uh, Abe Sapien, the Angel of Death, and the Chamberlain. And, um, and also then uh, 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 Pan's Labyrinth, of course, uh, was such a again, a fantasy tale with, with cl some classic horror moments in it and um, but such a, an emotional tale to tell. That's, I, I love it being a part of that. And, um, and then of course, when a movie like that, that, that might fit in the genre we're talking about, goes to the Oscars with six nominations and three wins, you're like, okay, this, this is the director who gets it, <laughs> who gets not only the horror, but he gets the art. And uh, in a way that resonates with the Academy uh, of Motion Pictures and also just the, uh, the audience at large. Uh, then, uh, then came Crimson Peak, where I played two of his ghost ladies. Again, it was marketed as a Halloween time, as an October horror film, but it was truly a gothic romance with some dark elements in it. And you know, when you've got ghosts haunting a house, yeah, you're gonna have some great visuals, but it was really a tragic love story that was happening. Um, and you know, uh, um, and and you you'll see again in After Crimson Peak. I, I was also on his uh, TV show, The Strain. Uh, I did like about six episodes as one of his ancient vampires, and uh, and then Into the Shape of Water, uh, which is that's another cl another classic tale, a modern classic that ended up at the Oscars with 13 nominations and four wins, including best director and best picture, something a genre film, I don't know what very few have done, if any, right, before that. So, uh, and he, he's been able to make his lead human character usually be an underdog that is trying to find their way in life and, and with some authority figure that, that is getting it wrong and, being, and, and working their evil. Uh, and so the underdog has to find a way around uh, uh, this, this, the true monster of the movie, which is the human, to a victory. And the monster is often a conduit to help that, that underdog do that. Um, uh, uh, so he's made heroes out of every, every monster I've ever played. And I just adore him for that. Because um, I feel like, 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 like also what he did for me and what he did for a lot of actors that, that play monsters and creatures is he brought some dignity back to that profession or that part of the profession. Mm -hmm. um, you know, back in the day when you're talking about Lon Chaney and Boris Karloff and Vincent Price, it's like they were, they were, they were movie stars and they were revered as such. When you, then we, we, we had a gap there where there weren't a whole lot of name people who were respected as, you know, classic horror actors. There were, you know, there were scary people that there are scary things that chased people down hallways or splattered their blood on the wall. But Guillermo del Toro is the one who brought back that, you know, 
uh, a monster with storyline, with emotional connection, with with um, uh, stakes in the game, like everybody else in the movie. Uh, that really, really rose. And and so then I start getting press, uh, you know, for Pan's Labyrinth and The Shape of Water, especially because they were Oscar bound, um, is when I did more more interviews like the one we're doing right now. Uh, more people were interested in talking to me, and it was like a head scratch. I was like, wow. I did not expect this, uh, but it's because it's because uh, those stories connect, and and then the, the curiosity of who's playing that monster comes into play, and uh, I so more I have more facial recognition now in public than I ever expected, especially later in life. I'm just, I, I just like I told you, I just turned sixty one, and after uh, you know I didn't really start getting facial recognition in public until my late forties. So I thought that time had passed, and I was okay with that. I was okay with with, um, you know, when you go to an event like a red carpet event or a, or, or a fan convention and you're not, it's announced who you are and you can be famous and a, you can be a celebrity that day, great, but you go to a Starbucks and nobody knows who you are. That's a great, that's a great dichotomy to live. Um, so, uh, so I did not expect though to, to get so much, so much press in mainstream news and magazines and dot coms now uh, to the point where um, I, uh, I, I am recognized in public often now. Uh, oh, you're Doug Jones, you're that guy. Because this face has been married to all my characters over all these years. And that really happened the most in The Shape of Water uh, when doing that. Because again, it was such a talked about movie. It was and, and one best picture. And, um, and every interview, most interviews that I did during that, that a whole uh, award season run were career retrospectives. They were all like, you know, just like, who are you? How did this happen? Talk us through the entire thing. So there a lot of a lot of large news outlets did, you know, these these great like mini documentaries on Doug Jones. So it was, you know, something I just didn't expect. And I and I, it, and I um, but but it's been a really really sweet uh, outcome from from you know uh, what you would think. Some people just think that I, I snarl and, uh, and wave talons at people and, and wag my tail as I run down a hall. But uh, but because of Del Toro, I would say he uh, he brought us uh, you know those stories and, and that um, the, the actor in me uh, to be respected in public, which I really really I owe him so much for that. Was there some channeling from? Uh... There's a lot of similarities between Creature of the Black Lagoon and The Shape of Water. Mm -hmm. um, was there some channeling going on there with uh, with you for the the creature? Uh, not intentionally. Um, I would say there was inspiration, at, at, both with Guillermo uh, creating the film, and he'll he'll tell you that you know he wanted he wanted to make the movie where where the where the uh, aquatic monster finally gets the girl. <laughs> so The Shape of Water happens, and he does get the girl. Uh, so, but, but no, he, uh, he created it and, and we had lots of time ahead of time to talk about this, this character. I, I knew this, this was a passion project for him. The minute he told me, he pitched it to me the first time. I was like, oh, wow. Uh, uh, and I, and I knew that he was a fan of the creature from the Black Lagoon. And I knew that this was kind of a working out of his childhood issues <laughs> uh, and those feelings of injustice that they never got together. But, um, uh, but uh, for me personally too, uh, that was one of what, that was I think the second, the first horror movie I ever saw was The Mummy with Boris Karloff that haunted me uh, and my dreams. Uh, and the second, I think uh, the second movie I remember seeing with a dark element was The Creature from the Black Lagoon. I too was struck with his, with his, um, uh, the, the, the beauty of, of his hideousness, you know, the, especially the underwater scenes and when he was swimming, it was just, it was just so gorgeous and I, 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 I've always been a water baby anyway. I, I've, uh, I love to swim. So, so it was kind of like a, a nice connection. So uh, this, so playing the creature, uh, the, the, the amphibian man in the shape of water, it was my second time playing a fish man, right? I had done that in the, in uh, the Hellboy movies as Abe Sapien. He's also a half man, half fish kind of hybrid. So so the trick for me really was to make this di different. I didn't want to play the same character and, and nor did Guillermo. He, he was very, very distinct in telling me, let's not be Abe Sapien. No, that's not why I want you here. I want you here because I know that you can channel. He, he said, I don't want a Doug Jones performance. And, you know, and he flared his hands in the air to show me, you know, uh, uh, you know, I don't want, I don't want to dance. 
I want Doug Jones, the actor. I want you to bring the heart and soul of this and connect to the to your lead uh, love interest. And um, you know, you've, you've got to you've got to bring the acting, not just a great visual thing with your elbows, right? So I um, that so we we really worked on the character from the ground up, but the creature in the Black Lagoon was 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 a we we knew that that like that kind of thing can be done by by seeing the, the example that was set before us many years before. The uh, I'm gonna get towards the end of the interview here because I know we're running a little bit late on time. Um, as you know, there's a lot of independent filmmakers in the Midwest, and the dynamics are different here. There's a lot less money. Uh, a lot of the independent filmmakers are working with micro budget or no budget at all. Uh, horror films are kind of the top of the list of go-to movies to try and do uh, mm -hmm. with independent folks. What, what advice would you have for a low budget indie filmmaker in the Midwest who figures, I want to do a horror movie, but I want to do it well. What, what do you suggest? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I would suggest doing it well because there there are there are so many who 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 go to that formula that we talked about earlier uh, and uh, and just think if you have enough like fright moments and shock moments and blood uh, that you're that and and I, I've watched a lot um, I I uh, but I've also if I'm approached I'll tell you from my end as an actor uh, when I'm approached by an indie filmmaker from the Midwest. Um, uh, I, 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 my manager, my, my talent manager knows not to say no to everything just because it, they don't have any money. I want to see what we're saying no to if we're going to say no, because I'm, there might be a gem that you might find. And I've done, so I've done quite a few more indies than I thought I would. I've done short films that I never thought I would uh, because the elements were, were all there. Um, if there's, uh, uh, first of all, if there's time in my schedule, if, if they caught me at a moment where um, I don't have anything else going on. And that oftentimes, if, you, if you're going after um, any kind of, of what, what we might call a name, or an established actor who might have a, a lot of gigs lined up, uh, you, you are going to be hard pressed to, to book them a year and a half in advance. You know, we want to shoot this in you know, the fall of 2024. Okay? Would you say yes? Well, nobody, nobody with a career can say yes to that because you don't have no idea what's coming then. Uh, so, so you can say I'm interested, but you know, get back to me when we're closer to. So, the the the, the success you'll find in getting in getting an established actor into your movie would be uh, um, maybe a, a few days commitment instead of uh, the entire run of the movie. If you're going to be shooting for a month, or if you're going to be shooting for two full weeks, and you want and it's got heavy material. Um, you might be better off to do to get a, a good supporting role that you can shoot in two days. And then if there's scene, scene, scene throughout the movie, um, and you can pay them well for those two days uh, instead of well for two weeks, which is going to ruin your budget. Uh, so, but to offer them something respectable that that makes it worth their time to to book out the time on their calendar to get on a plane and fly to you or whatever it is. Uh, uh, and, but that that's there. Um, but also, if it's a story that that the actor can connect with, uh, if it's a character that will stretch them or move them in some way, uh, make them laugh, make them cry. That's what I look for. I look for a, a character that I can connect with uh, that's either familiar enough to me that I love him and I want to play him, um, or that is unfamiliar to me that will stretch me and move me as a, and help me grow as an actor. Um, the character has to be there. The story has to be there that I want to help tell. Um, and the other thing would be, who do I get to play with? What other actors? And this is another problem with the Midwest is, is the talent pool. You, you, you Sometimes you pull friends and family for these. <laughs> and so you don't, you may not always get uh, uh, the, the acting quality that you want in there. Um, but, but, but there, there are many, many, there, there are a ton of great actors in the Midwest uh, who, and there are, because I think, remember when I was started acting, I knew I had to go to either coast. Well, I think that the business has moved all over the place now. You can live anywhere and, and because the work goes everywhere now. Uh, big filming center in Atlanta, Georgia now, um, 
the state of Tennessee has tax breaks. Ohio has the tax breaks. I've done two movies there now. Um, so, uh, so there are, there's the talent goes where, where the films are made. And, um, so, so I, I, there are agencies that have sprung up that, um, that handle talent in the Midwest. So I just think, you know, uh, take your time and, and for casting and, uh, and you'll, you'll draw more talent and, and, and don't expect everybody to do things for free. You know, you, you wait until you have some budget, borrow, scrape, save, do whatever you have to do to have some budget to be, so that you're not using your friends for free and, and you're not, uh, you know, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna feed you and give you a credit in the movie. That's not always enough, you know? Uh, so and, um, a little something that, that says we're making an effort, you know, uh, goes a long way with an actor, I think. Um, so, but, but mostly then, um, and then the director, whose hands am I going to be in, in this movie? That, that's another huge element. And that oftentimes if I read the script and I, and I like the story enough, and there is a redemptive quality to it, especially if we're talking about horror, I, I need there to be um, a, a, you know, a lead character who's learning something, growing somehow. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, with some substance to the story. So uh, uh, once that's there, who's gonna be directing it is, is just absolutely paramount. Um, so if they can, if you have any previous work, if I can see a link for any short films you've done, maybe a web series, something on YouTube, just to get a sense of your storytelling ability. Um, and if there's not much to show, I love, and I, all, I always love either an in-person coffee date, if it's someone closer to home, or if, or if, if I, if I'm going to be coming to the Midwest and I live in California, uh, a Zoom date like this, um, would be great, or if even a phone call where you can so you can talk everything out for a, a while and get it get get a sense of get a sense of their storytelling, get a sense of their their passion for this project, and get a sense of any questions you have in the script that like how is that going to play out, and the director can then tell you what they're going to do. Um, if you trust that conversation, that also makes the the uh, yes I'll do it quotient go a bit up, <laughs> you know. Um, so if all those elements are in place. And there's not a big money job waiting for me on the calendar that, that would you know preclude me from doing this. Uh, I'll 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 say yes. You know, um, so but those that's a lot of those are a lot of steps to go through before the yes happens. But um, so uh, did that did that did that answer your question? I gave it to you from my actor perspective, but as you advice know, goes, yeah, I absolutely think so. Think so. Thank okay. you very very much for your time, um, and uh, love you on Star Trek Discovery. Um, can't wait for the new season to start. Oh, thank you. Best of luck to you. Oh, well, thank you. And, and also another couple of movies I have in the can that haven't come well, out what's yet. What's coming up? Um, well, it would be, I just shot this one, uh, the, my first movie back uh, uh, during the pandemic uh, last year, 2020, a movie called The Knocking. And this would fit in the darker uh, genre. And this is another example of a, of a of, it was an indie that um, I don't know if it's found a distribution home yet or not, but um, it's called The Knocking and I, I was the one doing the knocking. So I was the evil element of the film. And it also, I was, I was haunting a young lady named, uh, uh, played by uh, uh, Alexis Knapp or, or Knapp, K-N-A-P-P, -P, I think is her last name. Alexis Knapp was in the Pitch Perfect movies. So, and we filmed out in LA. But uh, so I don't know when that's coming, but I bet it, we filmed it mm, almost a year ago now. So it should be soon. And the other one is, uh, is a, uh, it was my bucket list character to play. And that would be, we did a redo of, of uh, Nosferatu. Ooh. So, so I, uh, I uh, it, it, we did it, uh, the, basically we did the original silent film again, but as a talkie with sound. Uh, so, so the dialogue was was very true to the silent film that you saw. They didn't try to rewrite it or remake it. They tried to just honor it uh, with sound and with, with a, a fresh batch of actors. So I did get to play my dream role of Nosferatu, uh, Count Orlock, and, um, and had just a ball with it. That was a, a dream come true for me. So that's been in, in the making for a long time. Also, it was done on an indie budget. Um, uh, but but with more producer types coming on and adding money to it, post production has taken forever because it's um, 
uh, it's a, a lot of CG element. There's a green screen element to every frame of this movie because um, our director created um, the uh, the backdrop and, and the the, uh, the the production world was the original film. So what he had to do was go uh, capture the backdrops from the original movie as actors move around. He could get the information that was behind them, so he could have a clean uh, frame and then create, uh, and then we would be filmed on green screen with props and furniture in the foreground, uh, perhaps even a window frame or doors to walk through, but there was something green that he would put the original film in every frame of the movie. So, uh, so this is gonna be a combo. I got to play in the same world that Max Shrek did, basically. So it was really just lovely. So I, can't, I cannot wait for this to come together. And I, uh, uh, so- Do you have that, any that, idea when that might uh, be coming out? Well, they, uh, you know, they told me last year that it was going to be this year. Uh, so, uh, so I think it's next year, 2022, is the 100th anniversary of Nosferatu coming out. It was 1922, so that it came out originally. So I think a hundredth anniversary is probably what they're saving it for now. Is That's my guess. Awesome. And it is called Nosferatu. It is called Nosferatu. Well, uh, right now it's called Nosferatu the Remix. <laughs> so, because they're doing a mixed job of old and new. Right, yeah, because uh, Nosferatu was remade. What about fifteen years ago? Right? Uh, yeah. Was it? There was one. There was one in the seventies. I'm going to say. I there was one that was more recent. That uh, got more into. Well, maybe no. It was about the making of Nosferatu. That's right. Oh, oh, uh, uh, with Willem yeah. Dafoe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Shadow of the Vampire. Is that right? right. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Okay. Right. Well, that's awesome. Okay. Sir, Thanks. thank you very, very much. Oh, you my absolute me? pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay. And it's always, always good to talk to someone from, from, from the homeland. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, thank you for joining us at the Garrison at Nobleman Square, where filmmakers talk about their craft. Be sure to check out our other episodes. And until next time, Stay focused and keep your batteries charged.